civil service and local authorities and local public sector authority duty. That means you review the Quality Act every five years. But no sign of that in private companies. We've even got private companies who said, don't you pick one of the last selections. And I don't need to go into the detail of what they're like, it's just always disabled people. But it's a very, very serious issue, and it's through trade unions that we can lodge grievances and go to employment tribunals, but not every employer has that. And I think what the Labour Party needs to do is to take this forward with the trade unions who are affiliated and really wake them up about how we fight ableism. We don't even have a stand up to ableism conference. Laudable, we have stand up to racism, but not ableism. And I, sorry, I'll, if you allow me to ask another question later on about disability hate crime, I'd be very grateful. But I think that's important. My question is why should we should go out to the trade unions and fight ableism amongst all employment practices? as well because I think we I find conversation rather than confrontation helps because we get people who get angry and then that puts people back to so they then resist and I just think it, it's about just having as many conversations as we can with people about this and, and educating them training and training and training because I, I feel that the mindset of people have shifted a lot um, people are actually open up to it and, and they're interested to learn whereas prior to that I think people weren't so vocal but I do think we've got a different generation in
needing to show these people from COVID. And we've also got many of the people who don't count their um, attendance at facility that or identify as being disabled. But if you look at that, um, there's also this thing for the press of, of the scrounger, or the, you know, there's all these yeah. tropes that they put under us. There are actually only three million people who claim hip, which you know, I found quite astounding because it's that thing of everybody sort of goes, oh, you know, they identify disabilities as, as benefits, etc., etc. So only three million people are managing to get support, and that means actually how many other people have got stuck in their houses and not been able to make a disabled in life anymore? Because and as part of one of the big campaigns for um, the independent living fund, which I think it's just worth reminding you how important that was, and that was said when that was cut, and it's still being sent to full council, it's, it's amazing for people to go back off, go, go and visit friends, work, you know, partake in society, that went. So all those hours that people lived outside their houses went. So how many people have we got stuck at home who who are no longer able to connect to society. Um, that the government promised to reinvest that money into every single local council, but that has not happened. At the same time, they cut social care, which meant 33% um, of uh, care was cut. So people went from 24 hour care to sitting in counselling pads, choosing when to go to the toilet when nobody, you know, when do you decide to go and wee? Because nobody cleans them in four hours, you sit there desperate. You know, all those things just, you know, it's time for that. I mean, look at the tea, it's come, tea being placed in the sink and come back in four hours, take away that. You hear of people going to Tesco and being asked to put school equipment in the The amount of cuts around disability is just been absolutely crippling. The amount you're going to get help with nutrition, nutritional food, um, you know, if you put a makes people no less in society but at the moment we're being viewed as that and I think that's abhorrent because there's a lovely lady who um, was talking about it who said she used to go to festivals she used to talk about disability she used to go, go into schools talk about disability she, she volunteered etc she wasn't ab able to work because of her disability but she participated in society an awful lot and then these cuts happened and she was sat in an incontinence pad in her own home not engaging with anybody. And when she fought back to get more, she said she had three people in her bathroom with clipboards watching her go to the toilet and to shower. And that, that's not human. That's not how we should be treated. And, and you know, and I know that this changes from council to council, but the, the fact that we're now fighting for basic human rights that we fought for for many, many centuries. So now we can't participate in society anymore. You know, our disabled young people don't have that, that trajectory of being able to go to university if they need care. You're hearing about parents going and living in halls, you know, so their young person can go to university and study. Just, we're not seeing disabled people as human beings. And I just think it's got worse and worse and worse. Um, and what else is there to cut now? I, and then it happens over the weekend and they say 15 hours on universal credit over 15 hours. How do you do that when you are managing your disability? You know, I've just been incredibly poorly for 12 months. I couldn't get out of bed and go and figure out how to work 15 hours, but I could have had 
if I was on, you know, they, that would have been cut if I was at that point claim, you know, so it's just, yeah, we've just got to start seeing people as humans rather than this thing that, that people, it's these tropes, it's these, and these terrible ways that we've been viewed and victimised and vilified as and that needs to go and we need to start because people are not being allowed to live to their full potential they're not even allowed to survive at the moment okay um yeah um what does everybody else think about it i'm gonna ask anna i think the general public don't understand what benefits mean. They've got this thing in their head that it's money for flat screen tellies and nights out. They don't know what the figures actually are and how they break down. So we at Disability Rights UK will hear about people who are living on things like ESA, which is about £70 a week. So if you add up your gas, your electricity, your food, any transport you need to take to any medical appointments because perhaps you can't get patient transport, anything you need to live on, phone, broadband... £70, we know that doesn't come close to covering that for a week. And then you've got to find your rent and maybe your council tax. Mm -hmm. Benefits are broken. The, the benefit system is broken. It's opaque. You can't find out what you can live on before you apply for it. And then when you get it, it isn't enough. And the systems in place to procure benefits are punitive or shaming. And... It just makes me channel my inner Bob Geldof and just want to go, just give us the fucking money. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it's about dignity and independence, you know. If you give us the means to live, then a lot of other disabilities go out the window. Anxiety, depression, all of the comorbidities you get when you're neurospicy. I love this word, a neurospicy told me. It's a catch-all for anything in the <laughs> neurodiverse word, and I'm using it all the time now. But it's just, you know, if you give people the means to take away the anxiety, we can live with a little more ease. And then, you know, all of those things, the brilliances that we have, the skills that we have, we can use as meaningful members of society. We may or may not be paid for that, but we contribute to society. And that's what the Tories want, isn't it? Productive members of society I mean, that's what labor wants we want to be productive members of society but we've got to stop seeing it as being economic it's much richer and wider than that just give us the money so that we can do that and live without fear and with enough heating and with enough food in our bellies so we don't end up with situations like errol graham who died at five stone yes, having absolutely. been ignored for months found with I... his teeth pulled out with pliers and two tins of out of date tuna in his flat because he was sent benefit letter after benefit letter saying you have to come to an appointment and he didn't have the capacity to do that so they took his benefits yes. away as a we stick to beat him that. into turning up and of course you can't do that Where? pip needs to fundamentally change we need a whole new system which is about believing people when we go to them and say this is what we need to thrive we are heard and we are given what we need to thrive we are not made to jump through hoops of shame and hoops of disbelief to get dregs i i just want to say john who wrote errol's story is here somewhere where are you john there you are yeah John Pring, for those who John Pring, who wrote Disability story. News Service, yeah. it's worth reading every week. He breaks some yeah, very uh -huh. hard-hitting stories, and he's a you know he's he's a part of our community yeah. and writes um, I'll brilliantly. I'll get to you in two seconds, Vicky. What do you think about uh, the cuts and everything? Come on. I know I agree with everything that everybody's um, said. You know, it's an inhumane system, but also it's actually massively inefficient. You know, mm -hmm. you fill in a form, you then get interviewed asking the same questions that are on the form. You then do a mandatory reconsideration where you fill in a form like the form that you filled in and then you have an interview, like the interview that you had, which was the same as the form that you went and filled in, and then you get halfway towards maybe getting the right decision. Yep. And then, um, you know, if you're appealing, you go all the way on to appealing in terms of stuff. So, you know, it, like it is, you know, kind of a bit ridiculous when you go and put it like that. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing about getting the decision right first time. And then during that period, people haven't got the money that they need to be able to survive and and the thing is i will backdate it yeah, afterwards you never get back to it the right amount and even if you do it doesn't account for all of the debts and the extra exactly. money you gotta pay we, on the debts during that period what, what are you supposed to do like are, are you just going to time travel back to when you 
didn't have the money, you know? It's ridiculous. Uh, question from the lady wearing full purple over there. <laughs> just, been, just in front of you, Tash. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's not turned on. <laughs> Mm, no. Kind of, but I still don't think that's on. Hello. Yeah. It's there we go. Hi. I, I'm sorry. I'm not going to stand up because I do have a disability. That's right? fine. That's fine. Uh, you know, just an echo because I just recently put forward uh, the PIP and mm -hmm. I just had an assessment via, you know, Zoom and things. Condolences. Oh God. It, it, <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable hard, and I just find it so difficult because one question they asked me, how far could you walk? I said, mm. well, I would rather not to walk. I would rather someone push me for a reason. And mm -hmm. then she looked at me, you still haven't answered my question. Yes. Mm. Then I said, okay, five steps then, mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, uh, talking about property, I mean, I am in a good position that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm all right, you know, so I, my, 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 I talk to my friends and say, look, if I do get a PIP, I will donate the money to charity to support others because, oh, yeah, I just want to fantastic. be recognized because I'm... You I'm, fantastic Yeah, human. I have hidden disability that mm -hmm. nobody believed that I have hidden disability. Yeah. When I asked to go for a disabled toilet at KFC, the staff said, toilet is downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I just look at him and I raise, I raise my badge by Lanyard. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Somebody wear a mask and I could not hear. I say, could you speak slowly? Mm -hmm. And then she looked at me as if I'm going to rob her. No. And again, I have to raise my badge and she changed. And I think most, uh, some of you might be touched by mental health. You know the struggle with mental health. Absolutely. I was given a wrong diagnosis in 2017 that I didn't even know about it yeah. until recently. And so I, I was back and forth with my GP saying, look, I don't suffer from this condition, and I managed to pay for a private consultation mm -hmm. to have a correct diagnosis that I believe that is my diagnosis. And you know what my GP said? Because I asked my GP, could you please undo the wrong? Mm -hmm. And you know what he said? Oh, no, no, no. I got two consultants here, you know, two, giving two different diagnoses. You need to go for a third assessment. Now, it's a mental health. I don't want to go for the trauma again. No, no. Yeah, I mean, it's, if, it's if some of you know what I'm talking about, acute childhood experience. No, more, more. I score eight out of ten. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. And I didn't know yeah. about it until yeah, a month ago. I, yeah, it's awful, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. So I just, I, I mean, I spoke to the mental health team. I say, why should they put me through again? Yeah. You know, it just like it's, even it's, worse because my husband suffered from cognitive decline, and you yeah. know, cognitive decline, they fabricate a story. Uh, yeah. He told people that you know I'm being unfaithful. You know, oh, oh, things you don't want to hear about. And my son and daughter believe what my husband oh, that's said. Horrible. I'm so yeah. Sorry. So I just, I just want to share with all of you because I think this is a safe place to share. <laughs> we all have some kind of disability, Absolutely. and I just want to share, even though I'm articulate, you know, you I'm able know. to express myself. Uh -huh. But when it comes to disability, somehow people just look at you with tinted glasses. Oh, yeah, they do. Doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. No worries. Yeah. Uh, the guy with the checky shirt and then the guy in the wheelchair just next to you, Tash. <laughs> Hello. Hiya. Uh, Thomas Brayford from Brain Tumor Research. Fantastic. Um, I'm just wondering what the panel think about uh, the changes to the Scottish system. So they came into force in August. Hmm. So people with a long-term health condition or disability, which is unlikely to change, will not need to reapply or be uh, reassessed for benefits. Fantastic. Wow. That so. is fantastic. Opinions. That is it's humane. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's humane. Well, that's not really uh, yeah, I, may, I think Scott. Mm? This is what, sorry? I'm saying I'm a member of Scott's panel. It's a uh, team and don't believe them. Mm, but uh, is, it, is it not well, a good thing? It, it's absolutely a good thing. It just I takes that whole stress oh, it's off. Fantastic. It's a completely humane solution oh, it's great. I to a problem. Said, I, I thought you said inhumane. I was oh, really God, no, no. It is humane. It's the right thing to do. Well, Scot <laughs> Scotland had the SI interpreters in COVID. Scotland seems to take yes. much more. Well, seem to understand disabled people, so probably have been had been talked to by disabled people as well. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? Thank you, thank you for that. Um, the guy in the wheelchair here. <laughs> Cheers, thanks. Hello. So, um, I, I've been under reviews for uh, for PIP, mm. and as you just say, uh, I have. My name's William, and uh, I'm a local councillor for Old Swan. 
Oh. So with the 498,000 people in the city of Liverpool, there are two disabled councillors. Oh, my God. Right? And one is retiring in May, so that just leaves me in that respect, unless any more come forward. So uh, I won't talk about that because, mm. obviously, being a councillor is a civic duty. Yeah. Uh, but that's not always thought of by uh, the Department of Works and Pensions. Mm. Yeah. Who does see it as an income. Yeah. Everything's an income. Uh, and... Uh, and you, you get marginalised by that. But uh, again, I want to echo the sentiment that Scotland's got the right idea because one of the things, um, uh, my condition is muscular dystrophy. Mm. So it isn't going to get better. No. They know it isn't going to get better. Absolutely. But I'm constantly killed on review. It used to be that I had uh, a benefits for life. It was mm -hmm. a, you had a, a piece of paper that said mm -hmm. it's for life. That was it. Because of your condition. Mm -hmm. Which scientifically proven it won't get better, it only gets worse, it will deteriorate. Absolutely. Uh, albeit slowly or quickly, depends on what type you've got. So I do feel that, um, as, the, um, as we know now with, with the trussonomics, mm -hmm. Liz is not in favour mm. of, of people who were disabled, in my opinion. Yeah. Because it's all about the rich yeah. and class warfare. And, of course, you, you've seen the extra um, hours you've got to do. And the people can have all sorts of types of disabilities, whether they're hidden or whether they're really visible. When you've got a visible disability like myself, it can be... Um, you can range from condescending, patronising or discriminatory. It, it, mm. it, it just mm. varies all the time. But you do tend to let it go because otherwise you'd be complaining every minute of the day. <sighs> and as you know, n never mind the cuts, you can go to venues who say we're fully compliant. Uh, oh. And they're not. Yes. It's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> A, totally, a total lie. I, I went to speak at a, at a government conference in Coventry, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a local government conference as, as a counsellor, mm -hmm. and the bus that was meant to pick me up, because oh. it went to be a train, but in Coventry, the, the, the trains weren't on, you had to oh. get a bus. And this fully accessible coach, you couldn't get on it, because where the wheelchair was meant to go, goes up in the lift in, into, the, into the coach, uh. it, that was still had chairs in it, so I couldn't get on it. Uh. So my, my, uh, my, my thoughts here, because my question is, do you think under this Tory government, if, if Labour don't get in, will these cuts get worse? Because they don't care, unless that person's disabled themselves. Because mm. I've gone out campaigning as a disabled person, mm. and people go, wow, I didn't realise such a hard well, time. Well, not if he's disabled, if he voted for the cuts. Yeah. If he's so, himself as a shameful MP, mm -hmm. Tory, he's a Tory MP, he voted for the cuts. Mm -hmm. But well, disabled people... I, I just want to ask the panel, what, do you think it'll get worse? You know, oh, yeah. With, without a doubt, absolutely without a doubt, it will. It's gonna, it's gonna get worse and worse for disabled people, and the the only thing we can do is vote them out. There, there's nothing else we can do for it. The, the, yeah, yeah. There's nothing else we can do for it. Absolutely nothing else. What do you guys think? I think there. Are, I think we all just have to keep yeah. being fighting and be as prominent as we can. Yeah, and you know. Could pull together because that yeah and and try you know i think there's definitely ways definitely ways in making a change mm -hmm. oh, this lady yeah this lady yeah um, yeah, just a very quick point, more than a question, to say that in 2017, a Scottish newspaper reported that a um, doctor's surgery, a GP surgery in the East End of Glasgow, Parkhead, which is mm -hmm. one of the most deprived places in the UK and is consistently mm -hmm. up in the top four, put a money worker mm -hmm. in the GP surgery and that money worker helped patients claim £850,000 worth of um, benefits that they were entitled to but weren't claiming. And as a result, over time, they actually the amount of times that those patients were coming to the GP surgery um, decreased because obviously when people are more financially stable and when people um, have that stress taken away from them, then um, issues with their health can obviously decrease. So it had a, a cyclical effect then on helping the NHS. And just the point really, I suppose, is that cuts to things like Citizens Advice Bureau and cuts to all of these charities that provide those sorts of services will impact on um, on this topic that um, we're talking about. So it's not just the cuts to benefits, but the cuts to helping people access them. Yeah, we're going to move on now. Um, I'm wondering if, because I covered 
social care in with that as well. I know yeah. we've got time, so if it's to move on, we can come back to social... Because it's the same thing, isn't it? We all know yeah. it's just absolutely abhorrent and being cut more and more, but we did overlap with that one. Yeah, I was going to say, do you still want to cover social care, or shall we move on to... Yeah, I was going to say. OK. Um, Anna, first of all, tell me a little bit about you. <laughs> so, um, I am a mum, and I'm 48, and I work for Disability Rights UK as their communications person, and I've recently started writing a column for Mirror Online called Dislife, uh, which I was hoping to write about amazing, positive things that disabled people do, but because of the state of the world, <laughs> it's a bit of a rant. Um, and uh, I'm here today because I've been invited to have a bit of a rant about um, accessible housing or the lack of it, hate crime and education. So um, kicking off with housing. Um, it's, it's a state out there, especially for people renting. A lot of disabled people can't necessarily afford mortgages, particularly those of us with less income. Um, and the way that the system is set up, it means that we can't save for mortgages, so we're stuck in the rental market. And the government were um, making noises about changing that, so perhaps we could use benefits and you know, have higher um, thresholds in terms of the money we were allowed to hang on to before our benefits were reduced to get onto the property ladder. But all of that appears to be up in the air again. But there's a real problem with accommodation being accessible. Um, we're all aware that there is... Am I going too fast? No good. Uh, <laughs> I always check that because I speak quite quickly. Um, there's a lack of um, affordable social housing and affordable private sector rented housing across the board. But when it comes to being disabled, again, we have more barriers because there's even less housing, which is truly accessible. I know of people who don't have accessible bathrooms and are struggling to access um, grants that would allow them to adapt their properties or they're failing to be able to get permission from their landlords to change their properties. They're on year-long contracts, so they're unsure year to year what they can do with their property or whether they're going to be turfed out. If you have a grant to adapt your property, you're not allowed to apply for another one for six years. So you're left in a constant situation of precarity where you have no security about where you live whether you can afford where you live, whether you can adapt where you live. And I know people who are literally having to go to their friends' houses to bathe. I personally have to go to my gym to bathe because I've got a bath that I can't get in and out of, so I go and use a wet room at a gym every day. And that's kind of my normal. But when I stand back and look at it, I think, actually, that's not right, is it? Um, and... There seems to be a kind of a systemic approach that when there is social housing available, it's kind of the dreg end of housing. So you end up with something that is quite possibly damp or upstairs. So if a lift fails, you're stuck. And all of this kind of culminated in Grenfell, where um, Grenfell Tower was mainly filled with residents who were from ethnic minorities um, or were disabled. And we did the number crunching on the people who died in Grenfell and the majority of people who died were children and disabled people. You put that together as a cohort and that's the majority of people that died. And there's a kind of systemic approach by local authorities to kind of put disabled people in places where you can't necessarily see them, you know, at the top of the tower, out of sight. And then it just creates this colossal amount of risk. And we know in hindsight that the stay put advice for the people that lived in Grenfell Tower was, was bad advice. But there were no personal emergency evacuation plans for those people. They didn't know how to get out of that fire in any circumstance. And when the government was looking at revising legislation about the safety of people who live in high-rise accommodation, having personal emergency evacuation plans was on the table at something which could have been introduced as a compulsory measure, and they chose not to make it a compulsory measure. So anyone looking after a high-rise building does not have to provide an escape plan for a disabled person. And that just shows me and shows all of us what value disabled people's lives have when it comes to authorities looking after our needs, protecting us and treating us as equitable members of society is appalling. Um, I don't really want to say anything else about, <laughs> about any of that. Um, um, what, do you, what do you think needs to be done? What, what more could have been done? Well, we need to look at what accessible housing means. So, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, at kind of new build estates, which are, there's a whole raft of local plans that were introduced under Labour in Tony Blair's time, and they've kind of reached um, the point in time now where they're being built. Local authorities have had to find land to build huge amounts of housing to cope with the, the swells in population. But if you go to these places, a lot of them are very pretty and they might look a bit Georgian, so they've got lovely steps up to them. Okay. These are new builds. Again, 
where the hell is the Equality Act in this yeah. mix? Yeah. You know, people talk about cradle to grave housing and you'll often find um, plug points halfway up the wall now or slightly wider doors. What good is that if you've got to go up three steps? It's yeah. an absolute nonsense. Absolutely. And yeah. they're supposed to be affordable. So they're supposed to be a percentage which are available as kind of part by part rent or, um, you know, affordable or accessible housing or, you know, for our cohort. And there don't seem to be enough of those or the full access cradle to grave um, considerations haven't been taken into account and they're not built into the fabric of those houses so they don't really work from cradle to grave and I think fundamentally the people that sign off on these things do not realise that if they make adaptations from the off they're making them for themselves I think the way to get people to understand it if they can't understand it on a kind of let's be socialist about it level is that if you do this it's in your own best interest because you're pre-disabled right now you're not non-disabled you're pre-disabled we're coming for you. You're gonna, you're gonna have <laughs> to be embraced in the you. big unholy cuddle of our disabled love at some point. You're gonna be a part of our team. So you know, fix it now because if you don't, when you get here, you're gonna realise just what a ball ache it is. How little works in your favour. If anyone's keeping tally, Anna has now said fuck and ball ache. <laughs> uh, Sherry Lee, how do you get on with accessible accessible housing? It just makes utter logical sense to make. It's that thing of putting disability on the agenda again, isn't it? It's You just need to have it from the start and make sure it's accessible for everybody. And that's the thing. If we were in policy making decisions, then these things wouldn't happen. Absolutely. Yep. And um, I knew you forgot your name there, Vicky. Tell me a bit about accessible housing from your point of view. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And actually, in terms of being a local MP, um, you know, it comes up far too too many times, particularly kind of Anna's points about um, people being placed in tower blocks and not on ground floors. And actually, I've done quite a lot of work with CLADAG um, and, you know, the personal evacuation plans, you know, really, really, you know, big concern and government really had an opportunity to do something about it and I've <laughs> I mean sometimes it's hard uh, you know you, you don't think that the Tories can shock you any more than they already do and then with that and everything that happens after Grenfell I just couldn't believe it like I genuinely couldn't believe that they actually took it out of the legislation on purpose it, was, it felt very purposeful, didn't it? It felt like they were definitely doing it on purpose to hurt us. It really did. Um, yeah, questions. Susie, Susie Boniface, hello there. <laughs> hello. Um, anyone who doesn't know, hello, Rachel, how's she? Hi, Susie, hello. how are you? Um, I'm a reporter and columnist at the Daily Mirror. <laughs> I've come in very late, so forgive me if I'm saying something that everyone's already spoken about. Um, I developed epilepsy in my 30s and so had a very sudden and late, sudden education about disability and spectrums of things and everything else. One of the things that I've just thought about while listening to what everybody's saying, this gentleman here, the council and the lady there, and what you've been saying about social housing, is one of the problems the fact that there aren't so many disabled people in public life? Mm -hmm. How do we get them to be councillors and MPs when that takes a lot of money? Because, you know, if you're an MP, for example, I mean, disabled people, back me up here, but you, you generally need some kind of flexible working. You need to be able to work part time. Yeah. You need to have some, some fairly secure funding and you need perhaps to have some time off, work from home occasionally and subsidise public transport. So, I mean, I don't understand why we're not in Parliament because that's got it all written all over it, isn't it? That's exactly what MPs have every single day. But Susie, you could so, drive to Parliament if you're an MP and use one of the two disabled parking bays for MPs yeah. out of a cohort but of several how hundreds. do we get more MPs in Parliament when there's only about five, I think, MPs there's in there five. who identify as disabled? Yeah. Paul Maynard, though, is the only one I think identifies as having epilepsy that the lady mentioned earlier on. How do you get in there? Because passively asking to be taken notice of isn't working. No. I'm going to put that to Vicky. I thought you might do that. <laughs> um, you know, the... <laughs> 
the, there was a fund that went to help in terms of the access to elected office that that has been cut. I think we need to, you know, argue to make sure there is those extra funds because, you know, like you say, it's a life of Riley once you're in there. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Uh, we're, we're not all as bad as people think we are. Um, but actually, getting there beforehand is is hard. Um, you know, you have to go through selections, which cost money, even if you're not disabled. You know, you've got to go around and speak to, you know, if you're in the Labour Party, all of the members. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that happens, but actually the, the same kind of stuff and questions are for the council as well, because, you know, we're talking about housing on this specific um, uh, area, but actually when a planning decision's being made, if you have a disabled councillor in there in terms of that decision making, then, you know, the questions will be asked around accessibility, you know, uh, homes for life and so forth. Um, so uh, I'm not trying to not answer your question because... I think it's really important. I don't think I've got all of the answers, but I think we need to have money in a pot. Um, we need to um, have networks that help and support people um, to be able to put themselves uh, forward. Um, that, that, I do think, is for um, councils, school governors, trade unions, and MPs in the future. Um, and we've got to do better ourselves in Parliament. Absolutely. Yes. Can I say something? Yeah, this lady here. So my name is, um, my name is Jackie Taylor. I'm a very proud dyslexic black woman. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to come back to you, Vicky, if you don't mind, because if you've got, at this moment in time, a scheme in the Labour Party called Mother Ed, where women, some of who are sending their children to private schools, are getting funding to assist them to be MPs. I think something needs to be done radically in the Labour Party, whereby, and I don't actually think it's that, that difficult, whereby we can get more disabled representation in Parliament. I actually don't think it's that hard. Thank you. And the same, and the same with my community. It should be a percentage of my community, current space people should be, you know, selected. This, this, this idea of having just MPs from one little group absolutely. is absolutely okay. astonishing, and it's yeah. wrong within the Labour oh, Party. Okay, let's, thank let's, you. Let's, thank let's, you. Let's, thank you. Let's thank thank you. I'm curious as to why you think 5% when the population is about 21% disabled. No, sorry, so. sorry I, I should have said 21%. I'm, I'm also Thank disabled, you. so if it's 21%, let's make sure we have 21%. I'm talking about my community, if it's 5%, care it's been Thank people, you. Have, we don't have a voice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this guy here. Thank you, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm Stuart Adam from Dunblane Club Manager. Mm -hmm. I'm here, we're here to, to find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, I've, I've, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Put your mic a bit closer, mate. Put your mic a little bit closer. That's a better. Mm -hmm. Yes, basically, I've got Parkinson's disease. Uh -huh. I just was diagnosed for 10 years ago as uh -huh. such. And the Parkinson's is a terminal illness, in effect. It's not classed as a terminal illness uh -huh. as such. And basically, what, what the world what is doing about it? The people that are in benefits, is they're cutting them. Uh -huh. How are they cutting them? By stealth. Do you remember when you go back to the severe disablement elements? Does anyone remember that? Uh -huh. And it, it basically it was a, a, a benefit you got if you were 71% disabled, 51% disabled. Uh -huh. So you had uh, one blind, blind in one eye. Uh -huh. So then you had to be blind in one and a bit eyes. Uh -huh. If you were 50% blind, you didn't get it. Uh -huh. the, the Tories cancelled that benefit mm -hmm. and changed it with the ESA. Mm -hmm. And so the money that was different from mm -hmm. that, what they did is, did is they actually stole the money from the disabled. Because uh -huh. okay, they didn't give them the difference between the new benefit and the old benefit. Oh so gosh. The other thing about the ESA, my wife's next year, the year after, turns 65. Uh -huh. She will lose the ESA. Oh, gosh. In which case, you're losing £114 pound a fortnight. I didn't know that happened. There's so there's other thing, I want to get in, it's mm -hmm. yeah. been doing too much. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the, the Scottish example, yeah, mm -hmm. there's basically changing the system, not changing the system, I was on the committee, mm -hmm. 
from the, from the only punters, basically. On it. First thing we did, actually, is we, we stopped the music. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be a very significant. Mm -hmm. You know what the music is? Have you ever watched Daniel Blake, the film? Yeah. We look at the music, and mm -hmm. the music's played every time you sign on DWP. Mm -hmm. got the, the music. Yeah. Such. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. all gone. You could be held for, for three days or ten days. <laughs> Now they've moved on to the yeah, COVID. <laughs> Basically, they've only given to, uh, people in PIP £300. No, sorry, £130. People in uh, Universal Credit are getting 200 uh -huh. 300 600 as such. So uh -huh. how are we supposed to live with that? Again, they're stealing money again. Uh -huh. More disabled people. It's all they do, man. It's all yes. they do. Yeah. It's all they do. That's they it. just steal money. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, over here. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, her name has already come up. Um, I'm talking about access to Parliament for people with difficulties, whatever they are. Um, her name has already come up, Rosie Cooper. Yeah. And she had a period over the last 12 months where she needed to, she wasn't able to get into the the building sure. into, because of health issues and so forth. But her vote, and I know this because I'm in West Lancashire and I was knocking on doors this May for the May elections. And, uh, you know, questions were coming up. Why is Rosie not in Parliament? Why is Rosie not in Parliament? Now, she'd been paired. So in theory, it didn't really matter, but it did because she had a vote that she wasn't allowed to use. And yet during the COVID period, Parliament had remote voting. Mm -hmm. Councils had remote voting. If someone is unable to, to get into the building, I mean, access should absolutely be there for everyone. Mm -hmm. But if you can't physically get in there, why can't you use the technology that's available Absolutely. for people to be able to exercise not only their vote, mm -hmm. but the vote of their whole community and constituency? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Sorry. I'll officially speak now. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of heckling, I do apologise. <laughs> Maynard winds me up because he should be representing us and he isn't. He's representing the Tory party, not the disabled people that are within the world. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll get back to where I was. I recently went to Parliament. I won a thing with Mike Kane um, at last year's Northwest Conference, Tea on the Terrace. Mm -hmm. So I thought, sod it, we'll go and have a bit of time down there. So my friend and I went down, both on scooters, both scooter users, neither one of us could walk very far. And it was an absolute nightmare to get around there. And I think that will put people off. Oh, absolutely. Because the lifts... You could only hold one scooter at a time. Mm -hmm. And then when you came out of the lift onto the level that you, well, you, obviously you don't use that level when you're going, but just as a visitor, it was like a 23 point turn to get out of the lift, to get facing the right way, to head off, to go and see what was occurring in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Accessibility is a non-existent thing. I've learned, I was diagnosed with um, arthritis when I was 27. They told me I'd be in a wheelchair at 40. I've managed to stay out until I'm in my 50s and I'm now using a scooter. It's degenerative. Mm -hmm. But the amount of times over the years that DLA has been stopped, PIP has been stopped, rejected, and I've had to fight to get it back, even though it's a degenerative disease. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get better. I'm going to get worse. They could give me drugs to kill the pain, but they can't take away the arthritis. Why doesn't the government understand that? Why doesn't it see that something, it's not going away? No. I wish it would. I wish there was a miracle cure. I would love to be that able-bodied person I was in my early 20s, but I'm not. And I'm just making it, I'm a counsellor. I'm looking fortunate. I'm a counsellor on wire council. I'm educating them on accessibility. Slowly but surely, I've ne nearly four years now, it's nearly, my term's nearly up, but um, hopefully I'll get re-elected. And I've got them now to accept my scooter on the planning bus, because I'm part of planning. 
And I'm sure you can imagine what I'm like if somewhere's not accessible when it comes up in planning. But uh, there aren't enough disabled people to think that we're not represented no. properly. People like Paul Maynard put us to shame. No, absolutely. All right, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Uh, down here. <laughs> Are we doing the time? Uh, that's fine. We'll go back. We'll have this question, then we'll move on to hate crime. Yes. Hello. Uh, hello. Um, I was wondering. Um, so my mum said about um, um, the fact that in the end, unless you die young, young, um, in the end you're all just going to be a part of Team Crip. Um, <laughs> no. I must point out this is Anna's daughter. <laughs> Hi, Anna's daughter. <laughs> um, but why? How come? With things that are, are meant to be accessible, like, for example, on trains, it's like um, there are ramps and then when my mum has tried to go up them, the wheelchair has overhung it and apparently it's because it makes it lighter. But is it really that accessible when you can't get the wheelchair to go on it without a massive hustle? And also, you know, since everyone in the end is going to become disabled, why not just make, make it so that everything's there? I mean, if disabled people can, can access it, then able-bodied people can access it. So there's just no point in, in saying, oh, look, everything's accessible, and then just doing nothing when it's clear that things aren't working. Absolutely. Can we talk about the fact that came from a teenager? She's not a teenager. She looks like how old is she's she? She's eleven, but she's she's well eleven. Trained. <laughs> she's tw yeah. Like that. That just says everything. You know, she's completely right. Completely right. 15. <laughs> You're fifteen. Ah, yeah. You look at pal. You look at. <laughs> um, yeah. Off the back of that, if we could actually switch topics rather than hate crime, coming on to education. Why is Let's the, go on education, yeah. Why is the social model of education not a part of the <laughs> curriculum? Because it would be transformative. If we can raise young people, the next generations of decision makers, to understand this from the outside, then we don't end up with these epiphanies when we become disabled and nothing works, that we need to start campaigning to make things work. We wouldn't have to campaign if these swing, things were a part of the curriculum, if they were part of PHSE. And the other thing I don't understand is that we're the largest minority, 21%. We know we're, we're larger than any other minority group in the country, but we're still not really visible. So, you know, there, there are now conversations about sexuality and gender in classrooms, about race in classrooms. There are big visible national activities about other minorities. But owls still aren't really that visible. We don't have the corporate push behind um, Purple Light Up Day or um, Disability History Month or the, the other event in June, the Disability Month we have in June, which I've temporarily forgotten. The name. That's the one. Brain Fog. Disability Pride uh, Month. Disability Pride <laughs> Month. We don't have like Coca-Cola proudly sponsoring this or you know putting purple all over their bottles. So there's this total lack of awareness around society, and that could be changed if we were to put the social model of disability in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So people realise, as Aurelia has just said, that if you make it accessible, for everyone rather than just pre-disabled people <laughs> it works for everyone yeah. across the board um, <clears throat> but more specifically about education education doesn't work for disabled people um, buildings aren't accessible for people with physical disabilities for pupils with physical disabilities or really it's just started secondary school so we looked at a lot of secondary schools and there was one building I went to which was falling apart at the seams uh, this was in Kent, we're in Kent, and the headmaster was walking with a stick. And if he has to address something on the fifth floor of the maths block, he physically can't get there because there are no lifts. So if you can't go to school, what are you supposed to do? If you can't physically get into the school of your choice, how are you going to learn? And then there's a whole heap of um, mental health distresses and um, neurodiversities which are not dealt with in school. So there's a huge cohort of children who are school refusing. And the way that that's dealt with on a legislative level at the moment is that they are truants. And if they are truants, that's something which can eventually end up in the parents of those children being prosecuted for. So these children are off school with mental distress because they can't cope with the culture or the atmosphere in schools. And when their mental health is falling off a cliff before of that, they're told, they're told that they have to go or their parents will end up in jail. 
Now, if you were being bullied in the workplace, TUC man, what, what would happen in that situation? You can't cope with what's going on in your workplace. What happens to you as an individual? You're signed off sick? asking me this yeah. <laughs> you're signed off sick aren't no, you no <laughs> i mean it's absolutely dreadful they have the worst sick absence policies a lot amongst employers we have to fight like hard to try and keep them in the jobs we have to make sure that management slow everything down they have to go for every uh t every dot every comma mm. uh, so it's hard to dismiss them and we put the pressure on them but it's really tough because the law is not on our side it's tough it's but absolutely... you can do it whereas with school yeah. your parents end up in prison you know, my That's point is, if, if, you go to, if you go to work, your parents aren't going to end up in prison if you're signed off sick because of mental health distress yeah. or because the school's not supporting your neurodiversity. Well, well it's an interesting point because I'm going to ask you a question later on. I have been autistic since the age of four, by mm. the way, and neurodiversity wasn't around in my day. Mm. I was just called brain damaged. Nobody knew what autism Horrendous. was. And uh, it was, yeah, it was dread. Well, I'll save that for my question. Okay. <laughs> we will come back to you. <laughs> a lot of schools don't understand what adaptations look like and they don't know what person-centred adaptations look like. So there's an awful lot of lip service and an awful lot of tick boxes about, you know, you know, in primary schools, the main thing is kind of a happy face to sad face line. And, you, you know, you show your teacher how you feel about that and then they might pat you on the head. But it doesn't fundamentally address any of the systemic things which don't work for that cohort of children. So, for example, much smaller class sizes, one-on-one -on -one tuition, different learning styles, extra time to process information. None of those things are provided where you've got a system that is hot housing children to pass exams to prove that the school is attaining certain levels. Um, governors won't look at those because they don't want the school to fall into any special measures. And so kind of special educational needs and disability are not a robust part of Ofsted assessments. Um, and that's another thing that needs to change. It needs to be implicit in any assessment of a school that they're meeting the needs of their SEND cohort. My child went to a primary school and I looked at a photo of the kids that came into that year and then when they left to go to secondary school, a quarter of those children had left and every, every single one of them was sent. And they didn't leave in a kind of a, you know, a big crazy way, you know, a big kind of, you know, flounce way. They were just very quietly left because they were too scared to rock the boat because of the impacts on their children or other children in the school. So if Ofsted addresses that, those parents don't have that pressure of being ostracised by their communities and those schools are forced to step up. But that doesn't happen at the moment. Right, I'm going to pass over to questions. This guy has had a question since the beginning. I'm sorry. I'm going to let you ask it now. <laughs> Uh, my, my question is actually around um, education. So yeah. my name is Kendrick Fowler. I'm the, C the CLP, uh, Dis Disability, Disability Officer for Blackburn North and clearly CLP. So I've got dyspraxia, learning difficulty. When I was at school, I was basically treated like a second class citizen. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, I've got dyspraxia yeah. as well. I was the same. And ba basically, the, the things that happened to me, there's too much detail to go into now. Uh, but I left school when I was 13 mm. and I didn't return to education, to uh, formal edu any sort of education uh, until I was 15 when I went to college. I managed to get a degree when I was, tw when I was 22. Uh, a few weeks after getting my degree, I was applying for a job. I, yeah, I think it was, I was applying, uh, applying for a job uh, to be a teacher. And I said, I was on the phone to someone and I said, um, well, I think I'd be a really good special needs teacher, because I've got special needs. And before I could finish uh, saying anything, the person on the other phone, on the other end of the phone said, oh, you've got special needs. How can you teach people who've got special needs? That is ridiculous, <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. And so my, basically, um, my two sort of, my, is where two questions would be, sort of firstly, do you think when it comes to disabled people, people with learning disabilities being educators, that we should see that as an advantage rather than dis uh, a disadvantage? And my second question to Vicky, I don't know if she'd be able to answer this. Would, La would Labour look into reversing the current policy of the government whereby you can't get a degree unless you have GCSEs in maths and English? Because obviously I didn't have that. Thanks. Uh, can I add a couple of things? Can I just add a couple of things to that as well? Because I think that happens across okay. the board. So many people can't access higher education because of those constraints. Um, there's also why in uh, high schools is it down to the, the head teacher of what level of GCSE you can put in for? It means that somebody who has physical impairments 
has to go to a particular accessible school, but that means then they can't be educated to their equal rights. And the one that upsets me the most is why is it not against the law that our disabled young people who are nonverbal and have physical impairments are not being taught to read. It is down to the head teacher of whether those disabled young children are being taught to read, Absolutely. which surely if you have a physical impairment, that means you have no way of communication. How on earth are we allowing that to happen? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Okay, Vicky, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we you know, we will be looking into all of that. You know, the, the truth is there's uh, a lot that's in a bit of a mess in terms of the education system. So, you know, everything is, is needing to have, you know, a complete, re, you know, kind of re-look at where we are and what they've done at that point. You know, like one of the things I'm really concerned about is um, the cuts to all of the BTEC um, courses. You know, I did a BTEC and actually went to university against the odds when nobody thought that I would do. Um, and that was the route that allowed me to do that. I was actually doing performing arts. Yeah. Um, uh, we should swap jobs. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, but, but there's, a, you know, it, it all has to get looked into kind of together, you know, to, to you know, make sure that it's a coherent policy. Lady in this. <laughs> I'm going to try and be succinct so that other people get a chance to speak. I'm a teacher, I'm a working teacher. Yeah. I'm also um, one of the founding members of an organisation called Disability Ed UK, which represents the needs of disabled teachers and tries to promote disabled teachers and um, in the workplace. And also the, the um, founder of the Autistic Teachers Group. Um, there's two points I want to make about um, disabled educators and then about children who are disabled in the school. Number one, the Department of Edu for Education did a um, survey in 2016, then only 5% of the workforce in England identified as being disabled. Now, we know that there's complex factors for people identifying whether they're disabled and disclosing their disabilities, particularly if they are, if they are hidden disabilities and particularly if they have intersections. So people of colour and LGBT teachers may be less likely to disclose invisible disabilities because of fears of extra layers of discrimination. But 5% is still incredibly low and less than 1% of those teachers are in leadership positions as well. We call it in the education sector the concrete ceiling for disabled educators because and a lot of the time there is them um, it's very difficult to prove any form of discrimination but there's ve that it's unlikely that um that would, the, the reason people aren't advancing for any reason other than discrimination. So we um, obviously have a, um, a, a lot to do with supporting disabled educators that way because um, pupils in school don't um, won't think that they want to be teachers unless they can actually see disabled teachers in school. I am very open about being disabled in school and I have never in 16 years of teaching ever had a bad reaction from a parent or a child, but my goodness have I had bad reactions from other teachers because other teachers have a, cer a certain idea about what a teacher should be like and disability doesn't always fit that idea. So there needs to be a culture change within the education system to promote more um, disabled teachers. And my second point that we could go on about um, the issues for children with SEND all day, but I would like to say that when you have a behaviour czar who was given £10 million to um, promote behaviour hubs all around the country and the policies of those behaviour hubs, if applied to um, many children who are disabled, many neurodivergent children, would be discrimination, that is a problem. I, wrote an I was so angry about it, I wrote an article for TESS and it was one of the most well-read articles for a few weeks and not one person had any point to counter me on it because that's the issue. We also have a social mobility czar who is Britain's strictest head teacher, has documentaries made about her, she's never out of the newspaper, never off of the television, and if in her school, they don't allow children who have disabilities in because they don't suit her style of teaching. Um, the, if the behaviour policies in her school were applied to children who are disabled and also neurodivergent children, it would be discrimination. And yet she is being lauded on the television and by the current government as the gold standard. And we would, as, as 
a Labour government would need to make sure that the people who are being promoted as the best in education in Britain are not blatantly ableist. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, OK. This lady in front and then... Yeah. yeah, just a couple of points, really. Every time you spoke, I wanted to keep on asking questions, to be honest. But when you mention Ofsted, what they do usually in a school, they have done when I've been in a school, is they tend to put the children with behaviour issues and go out the way. So it's never a true reflection of an Ofsted report anyway. But the other thing is, the biggest tool the disabled people actually have is proper media articles, proper journalists. That, that is a massive tool for disabled people mm -hmm. and that should never, ever be underestimated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm really sorry we've got to move on. We're really running out of time. Really, really running out of time. OK, Anna, you're going to take over now and ask me some things about COVID. Um, <laughs> because I've not yeah. planned very much to talk about, so please ask me some questions. I, I did have one more topic, which was hate crime, and my simple point about that is that it does not yet exist. There is no disability hate crime in law, and there needs to be. Yes, OK. <laughs> yes, yes, that is very much... Yes. So, um, COVID, um, we know how much it affected our yes. sector, Rachel. Do you want to tell us just what the impacts were, uh, how big they were? Yes, of course. There's the... Um, there's the figure that needs repeating again and again and again that uh, six in ten people who died in England were disabled. And that wasn't even people who were vulnerable to it. So that wasn't even people who were immunocompromised. That was people who were in care homes, people who were uh, people who were autistic and people who were being put under do not resuscitate orders and people who didn't need to die. There were people who were basically just being left to die. And we could tell from the beginning, you know, when it was things like, when it was when it was things like, oh, we will lose a lot of loved ones. That was that was that literally what was said in Boris's speech, and we knew straight away that was going to be disabled people, because we just we weren't valued, you know, and it was it was always going to be us that were going to suffer. And when COVID was was happening, um, can you talk a bit about? what didn't happen for the disabled community um so things like shielding uh so shielding happened provisions. shielding happened and then basically it just felt like we were locked away we didn't have we didn't have we were promised the access to provisions but uh we didn't really get the time slots to uh to uh the supermarkets like we were promised we still had to um it was awful. I mean, it was a, a lot of people. It was a massively traumatic time. And it's one of those things where I feel like it, it felt like a massive shared trauma for the whole world, but for disabled, disabled people especially. Like, it's a, it's a shared trauma that we're going to be going through for the next God knows how many decades, you know? Like, because for a lot of people, we didn't leave the house for six, nine, six maybe nine months. I mean, I, I was... I, I say I'm lucky, but I've got a dog, so the only time I left the house was to walk my dog, probably tw twice a week, and even then I was, like, masked up to the gills and things like that, and if I came into contact with another person, I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm running away and stuff like that, and it was it was terrifying, you know, like... Um, and we didn't like, and then and then they started introducing measures that meant everybody could go out and see people again. When the, when the figures were were rising and rising, and it was things like eating out to help out instead of instead of uh, doing things that were protecting disabled people. So the people who weren't disabled were getting to see all their families and friends again when we hadn't seen our families and friends in months by that point. And then when uh, when the figures started rising again, even up until like Christmas last year, we were all having to miss Christmas with our families last year, whilst everybody was getting to go out, go out for Christmas dinner last year and things like that. And it just felt like it really showed how much not just the Tory party cared about disabled people, but how much society in general cared about disabled people to me, you know, because it just felt like our world they're locked away, you know, we can still go out and enjoy our lives. That That's what really it felt like, you know, and it was awful. And it's still happening because for a lot of people, the pandemic's over now, but we're still having to really, really, really be careful because uh, the strains are getting stronger and stronger. And, but because people have been vaccinated, they, 
it's it's still really really difficult to talk about to be honest like it's one of those things where it's really really difficult to talk about isn't it do you think that anything should or could be done given that covid hasn't gone away for those who still need to shield um there needs to be um there needs to be the um more immune that that thing where you can get the immune oh, what is it Yes, Evershield. We need to we need to sort out the Evershield and stuff like that, and we need to we need to have more provisions in place, and we need to have more. We just need to be taking care of people better, and we need to be thinking about people more. You know, we just need to, there needs to be more compassion for people more than anything, and not and not people thinking like, oh, I'm all right. You know, sod them. That's what it needs to be more than anything, I think. And yeah, Evershield would be great, but if people actually took the time to care about everybody else, then this would have been over months ago. So is there anything you feel that the inquiry needs to address specifically about our community? Uh, the, the, deaths and, the deaths of disabled people. How many disabled people died and why they died. Was it all specifically to do with... Um, was it all specifically to do with infection or was it because of do not resuscitate orders? Was it because they were basically left to die in hospital? Was it because they were left to die in care homes? Stuff like that, you know, because it's going to be a horrible figure. It really is. We take a question behind you, Natasha. Hello again. Yeah, sorry. I, I mean, I think what we need to emphasise is the fact is the neglect of disabled people in general, uh, lack of attention paid. I feel that in the Labour Party. I feel that in trade unions as well. Mm -hmm. That's really more of a general question I think we need to take forward. But on disability hate crime, that's because it's not much reported enough to the police. The police don't really, have not been paying much attention, just only just in the recent, in the last few years. Mm -hmm. But they have done very, very little to take forward, or take seriously what is disability hate crime. That's an absolute disgrace. Uh, also, I want to talk a bit about ableism because we suffer ableist abuse. I grew up with it all my life as an autistic person. And what I wanted to say, uh, I've had it even in the Labour Party, it's not a joke, because there are different causes of autism. There are genetic causes, and there are causes through brain injury at birth. I was lack of oxygen in the brain. I was attacked, insulted, and patronised by members of the Labour Party who, claim, who said they were neurodivergent, divergent, reported them to LABHQ to have action taken against them. But it's a serious issue that we need to be aware of what's going on as well. And I just wanted to allude to, sorry, the lady, or we say our sister in trade unions, but she was talking about autistic people in school. When I was put in a special school at the age of four against my will, local authorities ordered it in those days. In those days, they used to take autistic children away from parents in the 60s and have them put up for in care homes for the rest of their lives. That's what they used to do. But they tried to do that to me in a special school. Uh, one day, I was six hours without air conditioning, suffering on a hot, sunny day. When the parents came to pick us up, uh, they said to the teachers, why are you doing this to our children? They said, that the teachers said, because it's the Harvest Festival today and the parents of the normal children are here. This is back in the 70s, I'm giving away my age. If they found out about what this school, that we had autistic such children, they take their children away from the school. So that was the type of prejudice we have to deal with. But we still have it today. Yeah. And I think if we stand together in solidarity, all of us in this room, and if we take this forward in the Labour Party and trade unions, stop neglecting us, take us seriously, let's go the whole way forward, Absolutely. because we've got to put an end to ableism. They're talking about getting rid of racism, rightly so. Let's get rid of ableism as well. Right, Can I just uh, mention something on accessibility? Yeah. One of the most popular streets in Liverpool for eating out mm -hmm. is Bold Street. And every time a shop shuts, a restaurant opens, mm -hmm. and at least 30% of them have got no disabled access. Yeah. There's a Greek restaurant, got disabled access, but it's got a sign in the window, no disabled toilets. That's ridiculous. And this, this day and age is disgusting. Because I may reckon it, since 2004, Anyone who opens a new business that could have disabled facilities. Mm. Terrific. And it's, uh -huh. it's, it's a joke. Absolutely horrific. Um, we're running out of time we're now, really so we're going to go on to... Um, we're really running out of time. Rachel's uh, going to talk about reframing um, the way disabled people uh, are talking about. I was, was going to move straight on to Vicky, actually, because I don't even <laughs> think we're going to have time for that. Um, Vicky, let's talk a bit about the, disabled, the National Disability Strategy. Please. Um, yeah, and I think you wanted me to do a little bit of summing up yeah, as sum well. up the so. debate and talk about the National Disability Strategy, please. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> well, it was fantastic. Some people still left. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, you know, I think it's been really interesting 
if a little, um, you know, depressing um, at, at That's times. Disabled so, life, I'm um, sorry. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, just depress us a little bit more and then try and move on from depressing us. Um, so on the government's disability strategy, um, it's, it was unambitious. Um, it uh, didn't, wasn't really a coherent strategy didn't really deliver and didn't really have the buy-in of disabled people, disabled people's organisations, uh, trade unions, etc. And then, indeed, it was deemed to be unlawful. The government started off claiming that they were co-producing. Yeah. Then they claimed that they were consulting and the courts went and said you weren't even consulting. Um, and so there's still ongoing cases um, in terms of this. But and this is one of my points about this government. Mm -hmm. The government has reports into um, you know, the cost of living crisis with disabled people, um, plus a ton of other reports, mm -hmm. and they don't publish it. Mm -hmm. And why don't they publish it? It's a bit like this mini fiscal report as well. They didn't publish uh, the OBR stuff to it. Because they're hiding it. Why are they hiding it? Because they know what it's saying, and we all know what it's saying, even if we haven't read it and you know when I was saying about the government's you know uh, mini fiscal statement whatever you wanted to call it um, you know th there was quite a lot if you earn over £150,000 a year I mean how many people in here own earn over £150,000 do, <laughs> do a little raise of hands come on everybody raise your hands I mean I, I, I'm an MP and I'm not even raising my hand <laughs> um, oh, got a laugh for that joke um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know and what is what is really disgraceful? And I was just reading this this morning, and I think you you um, uh, read it out in Marsha's um, uh, opening thing mm -hmm. that disabled people, no one has got the hundred and fifty pound cost of living payment yet. No, no one. <laughs> I mean, what an absolute disgrace. What do they, you know, how do they think that they can get away with this stuff? Okay, now maybe on to a little bit more hope and a little less Ooh. anger. Uh, ever since I've been um, Shadow Minister for Disabled People, it's been very, very clear to me that um, disabled people feel um, ignored, not listened to, uh, not respected. And indeed, I think that is what a large amount of comments in the room have gone and said today. So I've gone to organise a lot of roadshows up and down the country. And nothing that I'm about to say is going to surprise anybody. And it's probably things um, that all of you have done. I've gone to make it transparent, unlike the government. And so all of um, the um, uh, sessions have been written up on the website, uh, uh, so on my website website um, in accessible formats um, because I think it's really important that not looking like we're hiding information so like I said no surprise to anyone in terms of just some of the top lines I've got I've got much more detail underneath if people want that afterwards but cost of living inaccessible transport access to food access to social care accessible communications in every single situation access to public services, access to buildings, the right to flexible working, access to work, less bureaucratic, um, making sure it's simplified, speedier and transportable, um, mandatory pay gap reporting, so I'm trying to be quick on all this stuff, but um, a disability confidence scheme that actually delivers employment for disabled people, um, reasonable adjustments delivered without fear or favour, Houses built to standards that are adapted and adaptable. Ensure legal uh, protections can be accessed and asserted. Disability awareness to be embedded in all public services. A national care service for social care. Inclusive education. And then on to the DWP, which is the department that I shadow. Get it right first time. Don't be the department that will persecute you be the department that will support people. So into work if you can and want to, and make sure that they're high paid, rewarding jobs, not, I was about to swear myself then, not. Do it, do it, do it. Oh well, I, I, 
Is, is crap a swear word? No. no. No, come on, you can do better than that. All right, shit? Yeah. OK, not <laughs> shit jobs. This is being streamed as well, isn't it, anyway? <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, make sure that you support people into independent living. I, I got encouraged by your chair. <laughs> Um, and, and making sure that you live your best life. Now, through kind of all of this, the one thing that I want to tell you that Labour will do and will do things differently, and we know when we get in, there is a lot to change and it will take time in terms of, you know, kind of all the stuff that has been um, embedded. But we will co-produce with disabled people. We know it's going to take time to build up the disabled people's organisations and the infrastructure to make sure that we can do this but we will do this and I'll just say why we'll do this we'll do it because society will benefit from us doing this mm -hmm. and also we will get things right first time we won't be having to go you know back and adjust things and it's complicated and there's court cases and you know it you know things will be so much better and as you've all said, you know, you are the experts by experience and we need to make sure that we maximise on that with a future Labour government. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we're coming to the end now. Uh, is there anything else that you guys want to add? Oh, actually, this is what I want to. Uh, I want to ask you all your one key takeaway from today. I'll start with you, Anna. But there's a lot of passion within our movement and it's not always recognised for what it is. But it's a real driving force. Don't give up. Um, you know, uh, my takeaway is that, that, you know, there are people in this room that, that care and, and fight and, you know, we're day-to-day -day people. Some of us have some influence, some of us don't. But there's a lot of hope and passion and we can't give up. Um, um, there's a big fight still to go you know on every level of society there's still injustice I'm kind of taking that as a very strong takeaway but also there's a lot of passion and that can drive a movement of change fantastic little tiny <laughs> uh, Sherry Lee what's your key takeaway um to reiterate that we've got passion but we've also got louder voices I think than we used to have and we've got a way of coming mm -hmm. together and connecting to make a change and I think it's about keeping talking together but my strongest takeaway is yeah can we have something that sorts out that we get more disabled politicians because it's lived experience that will make that change yes absolutely um Vicky what's yours you know mine is also the same we need to make sure that we have more politicians both in local government and in uh, national parliament mm -hmm. and actually you know throughout you know this session there have been a, a lot of people that could do far far better than a lot of people that I see Absolutely. in parliament so make sure you you know if you, if you ever want to contact me about advice in terms of going for stuff then then do and I hear all the other points about mm -hmm. different funds and so forth. And mine is that two hours is not long enough for a group of disabled people to rant about things. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us today. Again, we are Rachel Charlton Daly, Anna Morell, Sherry Lee Houston, and Vicky Foxcroft. Thank you for joining us all. Give yourself a round of applause. There we go. That's it. <laughs>